Hi, I'm Sylvan Kaufman, and today I'm at Adkins Arboretum, where I want to introduce you to the trout lily. Erythronium Americanum, an excerpt from Mary Oliver's poem, Trout Lilies, provides a beautiful depiction of the plant. Then she stopped, where the first trout lilies of the year had sprung from the ground with their spotted bodies and their six antlered bright faces and their many red tongues. In early spring, the mottled leaves appear in dense colonies in deciduous forests. At higher elevations, they can also be found in conifer forests. The leaves' resemblance to a brook trout and the start of fishing season for those trout leads some to call it the trout lily. Others call it adder's tongue, either because of the pair of leaves at the base of the flower stalks, or because of the shape of the flower, or maybe it's the long red stamens. Erythroniums go by many other common names too, like dogtooth violet, fawn lily, and yellow bells. The yellow flowers are made up of six tepals, three petal-like sepals and three petals. The sepals are often streaked reddish brown or purple. There are six stamens with yellow to rusty red anthers and a pistil with a three-parted stigma. The petals curve backwards as the, flower, as the flowers mature. Spring ephemerals take advantage of nutrients that have built up in the soil over winter. As their leaves die back, they release nutrients back into the soil for the other plants around them. Trout lily leaves are known to accumulate large amounts of phosphorus. They grow so densely, they help stabilize the soil as well. The roots form an association with mycorrhizal fungi, exchanging carbohydrates for increased access to nutrients and water. A trout lily colony may be centuries old. Often a colony is mostly leaves with only a few flowers. The flowers are insect pollinated and an important food source for queen bumblebees, as well as for other insects like these amorous soldier beetles. Spring queen bumblebees collect nectar and pollen from many spring flowering plants, and their offspring will pollinate summer flowers, including crop plants like clover and alfalfa. The seeds are ant dispersed, like many other spring ephemerals, and also dispersed by ground beetles and crickets. But the trout lily may rely more on vegetative reproduction. After seeds germinate, they form tiny corms, food storing underground stems near the soil surface. This corm will produce several thread-like droppers that burrow into the soil at a 45 degree angle, sometimes several inches down and up to 10 inches away from the parent plant. A new corm forms at the end of the dropper. Plants face a trade-off in how much energy they will devote to producing new corms versus flowering and producing new seeds. By focusing more energy on corms, the plants are able to produce stable colonies, but they're less likely to disperse their seeds to new places. There are about 18 species of erythronium in North America. In the east, the two most widespread species are E. americanum and the white trout lily, E. albidum, which actually extends as far west as the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. The western states have some very large showy species like the yellow avalanche lily, E. grandiflorum. Few animals eat trout lilies, although deer will sometimes eat the flowers and seed pods, and bears are known to dig up the corms. Chipmunks eat the corms as well. As Mrs. William Starr Dana says in How to Know the Wildflowers, the white blossoms of the shad bush gleam from the thicket, and the sheltered hillside is already starred with bloodroot and anemone when we go to seek the yellow adder's tongue. We direct our steps toward one of those hollows in the wood which is watered by such a clear gurgling brook as must appeal to every country-loving heart. And there, where the pale April sunlight filters through the leafless branches, nod myriads of these lilies, each one guarded by a pair of mottled, erect, sentinel-like leaves. I hope your country-loving heart will find a colony of trout lilies to enjoy this spring.